It's been a week of tease for spaceflight. We were hoping to see the maiden launch of both New Glenn and Starship Block 2 last week, but both have been postponed to happen this week instead. That's not to say I don't have anything to cover in today's episode though. SpaceX continued to make big strides at Starbase in preparation for Flight 7, including full stack wet dress rehearsal of the Flight 7 vehicle, consisting of Booster 14 and Ship 33, ready to launch on what is likely to be the final suborbital launch of Starship. More on that later. China conducted two orbital launches, one from Xichang and one from an ocean platform in the Yellow Sea. SpaceX were also launching stuff with four Falcon 9 missions during the week, one of which featuring the first stage B-1067, which became the first booster to launch and land 25 times, a milestone we've been waiting to see for a very long time. All of this and so much more, so sit back, relax and enjoy. The hype for Starship Flight 7 is real. The week began with Booster 14 standing proud on the orbital launch mount, awaiting the arrival of Ship 33, the upper stage for Flight 7. Unlike previous flights, aside from Flight 6 I guess, which carried a banana, Ship 33 will be carrying actual payload. Non-functioning payload, mind. Jack Byer from NASA Space Flight captured a pallet of Starlink V3 mock-ups through a factory window, and then later on, these were seen being fed through Ship 33's Pez dispenser door at the Ship Mega Bay. This is not how live payload will eventually be loaded into the Starships. SpaceX have a proper machine for this. This is just a temporary system just for Flight 7. Those Starlink mock-ups are nowhere near as heavy and cumbersome as the real Starlink satellites. When operational, the ship will eject the Starlings into space, much like a reverse pallet stacker, which is why it's often nicknamed the Pez Dispenser. One thing you might notice on Ship 33 are these weird little side nubs. These are an extremely exciting addition to the ship, as these are the catch points that will be used during a landing catch, similar to the ones used by Super Heavy during the successful catch on Flight 5. Now these are not real, per se. SpaceX has confirmed that they're not structural articles, rather just heat shielding and presumably some internal instrumentation to establish how well these protrusions would hold up during the extreme heat of re-entry. The ship is not going to be attempting a return to tower catch on Flight 7. It'll splash down in the ocean and sadly under the cover of darkness again, unlike the amazing daytime splashdown we were treated to during Flight 6. I said during the intro of this video that Flight 7 will likely be the final suborbital Starship flight, because Elon has stated that if Flight 7 succeeds, then Flight 8 may well very feature a catch attempt of not just the booster, but the Starship as well, something that can only happen if Starship first reaches orbit before making a controlled deorbit burn to reach Texas, and something very well animated by Evan Caron, super underrated artist whose YouTube channel is linked in the description, go show him some love. Now, the catch points aren't the only change as we move from Starship Block 1 to Starship Block 2. There are a host of improvements over previous ships. One notable change is that Ship 33 has significantly smaller forward flaps, positioned more leeward and closer to the tip of the nose cone, to reduce their exposure during re-entry and also simplifying the mechanisms and heat shield tiling. You can also see that Ship 33 has got some tiny little dragon capsule decals on the forward flaps as well. Another upgrade with Ship 33 is that it's sporting SpaceX's latest generation heat shield, along with a backup layer designed to mitigate risks from tile damage or loss. The vehicle also has a 25% increase in propellant capacity, with upgraded engine feed lines that include vacuum jacketing and an enhanced avionics module for improved control of valves and sensor readings. There are a few other big changes as well. SpaceX shared on a post that Ship 33 has a more powerful flight computer, integrated antennas combining Starlink, global navigation satellite system and backup radio frequency communication functions, redesigned inertial navigation and star tracking sensors, as well as smart batteries and power units capable of distributing 2.7 megawatts of power to 21 high voltage actuators. To top it off, the ship is equipped with over 30 cameras, providing engineers with detailed insights into hardware performance and hopefully offering us viewers even more spectacular footage of the launch and flight. Prior to Ship 33's arrival at the launch site, Starship Gazer captured some workers removing the scaffolding around the tower's communication aerials. Hopefully these will hold up as the rocket thunders past, as loss of communication with the tower was the reason Flight 6 aborted its tower catch, instead having Super Heavy soft land in the Gulf of Mexico. That was Booster 13. Booster 12 remains the only Super Heavy to make a successful tower catch, so far. 
Last week, it was spotted being moved from the Rocket Garden to Mega Bay 1. This was assumed to have been done to swap out the transport stands. It doesn't look like SpaceX are scrapping this thing yet. It has had at least one of its engines removed though. Raptor serial number 314 was taken off Booster 12 and installed on Booster 14 to serve as the first test reflying a Raptor engine on an orbital flight test of Super Heavy. Anyway, when stack, Monday saw Ship 33 begin preparations for its journey to the launch site and it was seen being lifted onto a transport stand outside Mega Bay 2. It was a couple of days before we then saw it depart the Mega Bay, heading down to the launch pad on a roughly one hour journey from build site to the chopsticks. From there, it was lifted, completing the Flight 7 full stack, ready for launch. Before this though, SpaceX opted to conduct a full wet dress rehearsal of the vehicle. I'm sure you all know what these are by now, but just in case you don't, a wet dress rehearsal is a critical pre-launch test in which the rocket is fully loaded with cryogenic propellants, hence the term wet, in the case of Starship, these being liquid oxygen and methane, in order to simulate the conditions the rocket will experience during the real launch. The full countdown sequence is carried out, stopping just before engine ignition and launch, allowing teams to verify that all systems like fuel fueling, pressurization, and onboard avionics function as expected under operational conditions. The wet dress rehearsal also serves as a practice run for the launch team themselves, providing an opportunity to rehearse procedures and identify potential issues in a controlled environment. And with the completion of the wet dress rehearsal, SpaceX are ready to go. So far, the launch has been pushed back to no earlier than Wednesday, my dudes, so keep an eye out for announcements. Best place is SpaceX's Twitter X. page or their website for updates. While SpaceX didn't launch Starship last week, that didn't stop them from launching four Falcon 9 rockets. Three of these missions were Starlink launches, which these days I just lump together into one segment since they're all functionally the same. In total, the Starlink constellation grew by 66 satellites across the three launches, and with the completion of the third Starlink mission, SpaceX confirmed that the Starlink direct-to-cell constellation now has 400 satellites. These satellites differ from the regular Starlinks by being able to interface directly with cell phones, no ground antenna required, to enable phone access to texting, calling and browsing and eliminating dead zones across land, lakes and coastal waters. All three Falcon 9 first stages made successful drone ship landings and I do need to give special mention to Booster 1067, which supported the Starlink launch last Friday. With completion of this flight, it has now become the first ever orbital booster to launch and land 20 25 times. This one life-leading Falcon booster alone has launched four Dragon missions, including eight astronauts, to the International Space Station and more than 430 spacecraft to orbit during its four years of service. I wonder what SpaceX's limit is on these boosters, if it's a set number, or will they just make the call during inspections that a booster has flown too many times for further flight due to things like materials degrading due to the stress of orbital launch? How many more flights do you think we might see from Booster 1067? Let me know what you think in the comments below. In addition to the three Starlink flights, SpaceX also launched the mission Enrol 153, carrying 21 Star Shield satellites to orbit. These are the little known about military grade version of Starlink, developed by SpaceX and Northrop Grumman for the US National Reconnaissance Office. Naturally, very little about the ways in which these satellites differ from civilian Starlink ones has been publicly disclosed. After stage separation, Falcon 9's first stage landed on the Of Course I Still Love You drone ship in the Pacific Ocean, marking its 22nd overall launch and landing. Now, we were very much hoping to see New Glenn launch last week, Blue Origin's first foray into orbital launches and set to go head to head with SpaceX's Falcon. While similar to Falcon 9 in that it's a single stack rocket with a recoverable first stage, New Glenn is a far more capable beast. Standing 98 meters tall and 7 meters wide, it's able to carry roughly double the payload mass of Falcon 9, making it closer in capability to Falcon Heavy. Although Falcon Heavy can carry around 20,000 kilograms to orbit more than New Glenn, New Glenn works out more efficient considering Falcon Heavy these days always expends its core, and New Glenn has a much larger payload fairing, meaning that it can carry physically larger payloads than Falcon can. Not that this will be the case for the maiden flight, it'll be carrying just a prototype Blue Ring spacecraft platform in a demonstration launch for the United States Space Force's National Security Space Launch Program. There it is at the kind of base of the fairings. <laughs> Blue Ring is also developed by Blue Origin, and it's a spacecraft platform designed to facilitate spacecraft operations, aiming to offer capabilities like satellite refueling, transport, and hosting. 
The most recent launch attempt made by Blue Origin was actually earlier today, but this was aborted from Launch Complex 36 at Cape Canaveral in order to troubleshoot a vehicle subsystem issue. Not much more has been shared, but speculation is that there was some problem with ice buildup. Despite no launch, Blue Origin did release a flight profile video today. The rocket will lift off with roughly 177,000 kilograms of thrust at liftoff, courtesy of its seven BE-4 engines, encountering maximum aerodynamic pressure, or just max Q, at around 12 kilometers, a significant event as it's the point at which stress on the vehicle is at its highest. After three minutes, we'll see engine cutoff, followed by stage separation. From there, the first stage will begin its journey back to Earth, while the second stage will continue on, powered by two BE-3U engines. The first stage booster will first reorient in the vacuum of space and perform an exo-atmospheric deceleration burn at 67 kilometers using its three central engines, the only engines of the seven that have thrust vectoring. It'll then steer itself towards the Jacqueline landing barge using its strakes and fins, with first stage landing burn starting up at just under 3,000 meters, which will last for 20 seconds and will then be followed by shutdown down of the two outer engines, with the center engine remaining lit, to execute the final controlled maneuver onto the landing platform. Meanwhile, in space, the second stage will carry the payload toward its final orbit. Fairing deployment will occur at around 120 kilometers, with payload separation not too long after. And that's pretty much what to expect. No hard information has been relayed regarding the next launch attempt, but it's looking like no earlier than Wednesday the 15th, which puts this launch very close to Starship Flight 7. One interesting thing to note is that while I mentioned that New Glenn is not as capable as Falcon Heavy in terms of mass to orbit, Blue Origin is working on a more powerful 9-engine variant, according to the description of a job posting with them. While New Glenn didn't launch last week, we did see a Chinese Long March 3BE lift off from the Xishang launch complex on Monday, carrying the Shred Gen 25 satellite to geosynchronous orbit. Official sources have stated that the satellite reached its planned orbit successfully, and it'll be used as a technology test platform primarily for the verification of satellite fuel replenishment and life extension service technologies. And that wasn't the only launch we saw from China. A Jialong 3 rocket lifted off from the Dongfang Hang Tian Gang platform in the Yellow Sea in the early hours of today, carrying 10 Senti space positioning and navigation satellites to low Earth orbit. If you enjoyed this video, then I make space news content every Monday and Kerbal Space Program videos every Saturday. Except for last Saturday, unfortunately. Some unexpected personal life happenings meant I couldn't get Saturday's video completed to a standard I was happy with in time. So that's going to be this Saturday instead now. So make sure that you're subscribed to the channel so that you don't miss it. It's shaping up to be a really fun mission. And for now, do check out the two other video suggestions from my channel that are on screen. And consider supporting the channel by joining my Patreon or YouTube channel member program like the good folk on the right did. But other than that, that's all from me today. Thank you so much for watching and a massive thank you if your name is on the right there. I hope you enjoyed and I'll see you all next time.